episode 72 of Between Two Wheels podcast, cycling news, commentary, analysis, and interviews from Northern California. This episode is brought to you by Health IQ, an insurance company that helps health conscious people get special life insurance rates. Go to healthiq.com slash BTW to support the show and learn more. And as always, subscribe, share the show via iTunes, Stitcher, Podbeam, whatever other podcast service you use. And for this week, the show will also be on our Between Two Wheels YouTube channel as usual. Interact with us on Facebook by uh, Facebook page by searching uh, Between Two, the number two wheels. And the links will also be in the show notes uh, and found in the description of this feed. Hello, I'm your host, Tyler Yonke, for today's special Tour de France preview, 2008 preview show. Uh, we will preview the route, uh, the contenders, make some predictions. Uh, we're going to come up with them. Um, you know, this is coming up in the sweet spot of summer. You've got Wimbledon going for sports here. Uh, the British Open is going to be coming up. World Cup is just concluding, hence uh, one of the reasons why the Tour de France is pushed back a little bit. And, of course, the Tour de France. Um, it's the 4th of July as we're recording this. And... You know, for the fourth, we usually have we're in the tour, and there's usually a chance for an American to disappoint us just a little bit uh, with the Tour de France. Um, you know, we always hope for a, a American victory on Fourth of July, just like the French are always hoping for one on the 16th of July, Bastille Day, the kind of their Independence Day. Anyway, so that's what we have. Uh, the race history. So this is the 105th Tour de France. It's a two-point UWT three-week, 21-stage race in France annually held in July. The first edition was held in 1903 and was organized to increase, as everyone joined in, sales of the newspaper uh, El Auto. Uh, the race was now run by the Amory Sports Organization, ASO. We'll talk about them in a little bit. Uh, the race was in hiatus for the two big world wars. You want to guess which ones? Anybody? Uh, world War One and World War Two for those uh, keeping score. Modern versions pass through the Alps, Pyrenees, mountains, and uh, they end in Paris, France on the Champs-Élysées. Uh, some past winners we're going to go over here. Um, as you may know, Lance Armstrong has been discredited or wiped out of the records books. Uh, but there are four riders in history, each tied with five wins if we discount Lance, which the record books have done. So, of course, this overlooks Lance and his seven wins that have been stripped. But you got Jacques Anquetil from France. Uh, Eddie Merckx from Belgium, Bernardi No of France, and Miguel Andrain, the most recent uh, from España, Spain, uh, all with five. Defending champ Chris Froome has four victories and is poised to, poised to join the club with five wins now that his salbutamol case has been resolved. That's news to you. Um, it's news to you. Uh, for those other ones, we'll, I will talk about that a little bit, but kind of... Uh, Chris Froome had the salbutamol high levels in his concentration in his urine from the 2017 Vuelta. Um, it's a non-analytical finding that they had said he had to go do a pharmacokinetic test to prove that he had these higher levels in his system. Think of it like saying you're allowed to have two glasses of alcohol, but now we're going to test your urine to see if you're over the limit. But the limit is you can take two. So he had multiple puffs, whatever that was going to be, but then they test it. So it's a weird dynamic there. There's a lot of controversy. I don't think anybody, you know, I get texts that morning that it's worst thing from cycling. Um, see online, some people are just like exasperated over it. Others are exalting the the wonderful um, Froom and that he's been exonerated. I think there's some nuance that needs to be had in there. And once, um, I'm not going to go down the route of saying, you know, well, he's been exonerated for the, the testing, but I want to see all the data. I mean, to me, that's that's what it is. One, he has the opportunity to go through this process, so he gets his due process. Uh, two, he submitted a bunch of information. There's been te- uh, info out that he was doing anywhere from you know 5,000 pages, 1,500 pages. I saw one today that said the actual number was 162, 162 pages that um, his team submitted to uh, it wasn't CAS, it was UCI, maybe it was CAS, uh, UCI and WADA. Um, but one thing you're also looking at, I saw a, I think it was Ross Tucker, I've got to get the name correct, but it was uh, one of these anti-doping doctors in Australia, and his, I don't think he was taken too fine, uh, fine to room, but what kind of came out of the interview was that the testing, uh, the way it is, it's not the greatest. So, you know, I don't know what you guys know, but I think too many people watch the NCIS, these 
uh, CSI type shows and they think that everything gets done with magnificent medical scientific data and then we're, we're you know the truth comes out well that's that's the case but there's a lot of people on death row that have you know the cases have been overturned with dna or that some of the stuff is not quite what you think it is so you have a, a test for salbutamol and um kind of the way it's come out is maybe this test wasn't up to snuff um so i would like to make sure that these riders um, one we're catching legit cheats and two we're not putting someone through the rigor, uh, and I'm not saying this is for him at all, um, but putting them through the rigor of maybe they can't afford to really, you know. So, so what kind of came out of this was that the test wasn't that great. Uh, Froome was able to, or he would have been able to show some some problems with it because he has a ton of money to do so, and some of these other riders didn't. But, you know, those other riders should be afforded the same quality of testing, and if the test has got a problem, then that should be an issue. Okay, so regardless, we can talk about that forever. And if you want to, please chime in on our Facebook page or send us a link, Twitter, um, however you want to contact, and our YouTube. You know, we get we get feedback there. Um, people are still defending Phil Guyman. One person uh, made a comment that, uh, of course, Phil raced clean. I'm like, well, do, what do you mean, of course? You know, everyone, everyone's guilty, but the guy I like, and I was saying feels guilty or that he's dirty. Is it because he got a clean tattoo? Is that, is that why it's obvious that he's racing clean uh, or that he couldn't make it in the world tour? And that was why he's, it's obvious. Okay. Regardless from there, uh, make some comments. Okay. Let's go a little recap here. Like I said, Froome is defending champion. Just won the, uh, the, the, the vault of this in 2017. He also won the uh, Giro d'Italia in 2018, came off of that. Um, so let's do a recap of the podium from last year. We had Froome, Team Sky, uh, Rigoberto Uran from who then was Cannondale Draypack, 54 seconds back in second. Roman Bardet third at 220. Uh, Mikel Landa, Team Sky at 221. Fabio Aru, not racing this year, 305. Uh, sixth place was Dan Martin at 442. Remember, remember Dan Martin um, went down in that wreck with Port and he was not looking good. I think he fractured some tailbone, or we'll have to get the full medical, but he was definitely injured. Simon Yates, uh, 6'14". Uh, Louis Menches, 820 for eighth place. Alberto Contador, 849, uh, is now retired for ninth place. And Warren Bargui, uh, 10th place for France at 925. All right, so let's talk a little bit about some of the history of the race. So I'm going to do a route preview, of course. We're going to go over this. But I think it's good to also take along, uh, get some history of it. You know, my my dad, um, I grew up with the, the three major sports in our house, baseball, basketball, and football here in the States. And I've always said my dad was a scout for the 49ers and the New York Yankees, his two favorite teams. But uh, those teams just didn't know it. Um, basically the point there is he put a lot of work into his stats. He loved to tell me the 440 times as some new, you know, wide receiver for the Niners and he was big into it. And, you know, growing up, that's, that's the way a lot of kids are. So maybe, maybe you do, or you don't know some of the history of the tour, but let's just go through some of this, uh, especially with the North Americans, <clears throat> excuse me. Jonathan Boyer, uh, first American to take part in the Tour de France in 1981 with his team, Renal Elf. Uh, that year, Bernard Hinault took his third of five Tour de France wins by beating Lucien Van Imp by 14 minutes. Think about that. We just went over the Tour de France from last year. What did we have? We had the winner, uh, Chris Froome, 54 seconds over Iran, 220. You know, we go all the way to 10th place at 925. Bernard Hinault, 14 and a half minutes. Uh, Jonathan Boyer was 30 seconds on G- 32nd on GC and got ninth on stage 10. Uh, after Boyer came Greg LeMond. Greg won three tours, 86, 89, and 90. And But for his hunting accident, nearby here in Lincoln, you know, we go a ride, um, the Copy Republic ride, goes right by the place where, where he was turkey hunting and got shot in 1986. So he won um, between the winds of 86 and 89, he gets shot. Around the time Greg LeMond um, came, we had the 7-Eleven team led by Andy Hampson and Davis Finney. Davis uh, has won stages at the tour. He also collected I mean, massive wins uh, throughout his career. Um, Peter Stetna's uncle, I think, uh, or what, no, it was Wayne Stetna. Um, I don't think they rode the tour. I, I, I take that back. And but anyway, uh, Peter Stetna, his uncle, uh, Peter Stetna is in this tour, I believe. Uh, maybe he's not. I don't know. Nineteen eighty-seven. We also saw Seven Eleven take uh, multiple victories. They had Andy Hampson near the front, and they gave Jeff Pierce. Uh, the final win 
uh, on the Champs Elysees, nearly overcoming uh, Canadian Stu Bauer, who ended up writing for them a few years later. And Hampston wouldn't get his win. Davis Finney had predicted that Andy Hampston was going to win the tour someday. But he uh, w- did win the most prestigious stam- stage as a climber in the 1992 Alpe d'Huez stage. And he was also on the podium until the final time trial that year and ended up fourth overall. Um, as Andy is interesting, as Andy's winning the stage up the Alpe d'Huez, Greg LeMond is actually quitting the race, he loses like 45 minutes, and he only rode the Tour de France one more time after that. Following Andy and Greg, a uh, new little new area of cycling, era of cycling, rash of Americans vying for the podium overall, Kevin Livingston, Bobby Julek, Tyler Hamilton, George Hincapie, and of course, Lance Armstrong. Some of these guys, you know, they turn themselves into quite the tour contenders. Um, you know, all of those guys that I just mentioned there too had very good uh, junior careers. So it wasn't a surprise necessarily that they came up. However, they, they did, um, they took advantage of the fueling that goes on for uh, that 90s era <sighs> extra fuel and we know what happened with them okay some anniversaries we got five years ago 2013 chris Froome, nairo quintana and, and uh, joaquin rodriguez uh, win marcel kittle gets four stage wins 10 years ago in 2008 carlos sastra cadell evans denny menchoff are the top bernard cole i don't know if you remember him he was a german uh, up high in GC that year, DQ'd. Christian Vandeveld was fourth overall that year. We had Tom Boonen. He had tested positive for cocaine. For cocaine. This kind of came back with um, out of competition, and then therefore he was banned from the Tour de France in 2008. 2009, they actually tried to, the Tour de France ASO tries to say, hey, you're not able to actually come and do our race. Um, they, his team at the time, Quick Step, some sort of um, derivation of that team, uh, contested it, appealed it, and he was able to race. So that would have come into play because ASL had tried to use the same tactics with Froome this year. Uh, Belt, Manuel Beltran um, tested positive for EPO on stage one 10 years ago in 2008. His whole team withdrew. Um, we And I have a list of things that happened in 2008. It was a bad, bad year for... You had, uh, prior to stage nine, five riders with elevated hematocrit levels. Uh, Moises Danios was tested positive for ED- EPO for Team Brother World a few days later. July 17, Rico and his entire Sonnier Duval team withdrew. They were positive for Mycera. So it's kind of that new, including Linear Pippoli, uh, that new Sarah EPO, uh, synthetic EPO. On the last stage uh, of the race, Dmitry Fofanov was reported positive for heptanomal, heptanomal. Uh, after the race, following riders were found positive for Mycera from the samples taken. Ricardo Rico. Leonardo de Pippoli, Stefan Schumacher. Uh, Jimmy Casper had a TUE uh, for 12 years for asthma, uh, but he failed a new exemption, failed to, to file it. So he was positive, but he ended up being exonerated by the French cycling. So uh, 10 years ago, a rash of doping issues in the tour. 20 years ago, 1998, Marco Pantani wins. Jan Ulrich second. American Bobby Julik third. Still, I believe, able to hold on to that. All known dopers. Um, but they've still been able to retain their victories. This race was probably best known for the Festina affair, a bunch more anti-doping problems you've got all throughout that race. 25 years ago in 1993, we got Tony uh, Miguel Indurain, Tony Rominger, Zenon Ziascula. Who? Zenon Ziascula? You know, you don't remember that guy? That was the year uh, Indurain wins third straight Tour de France on his way to his successive five. It's also the year America Lance Armstrong wins stage eight in a preview of things to come as he claims a world title later that year in Norway. So a little interesting dichotomy you have here, or connection, I guess, simil- simil- similar issues. Ten years after Greg LeMond won his first world title in 1993, 19, uh, sorry, 1983, um, Lance Armstrong wins his first stage. Um, in, I'm sorry, his first world title. Uh, then they both come to a potentially deadly health issue, Greg's hunting accident, Lance's career uh, cancer scare in 86 and 96, kind of just following the path, respectively, only recover from a dramatic Tour de France win in 89 for both of them. Kind of weird, but that's just kind of the way it went. Uh, 30 years ago this year, 1988, 30th anniversary of a win by Pedro Delgado over Stephen Rooks of the Netherlands and Fabio Parra of Colombia. Um, this Roy race did not have the 86 champ Greg LeMond and, uh, or the 87 champ Stephen Roach from Ireland. Uh, Hampton had just won the 88 Giro and was perhaps a little overcooked for this edition of the race. All right, that's a little history recap we have. Now, let's talk about the route. 
This year's race, 3,329 kilometers starting on Saturday, July 7, ending 21 stages later on Sunday, July 29. Uh, The 2018 race was moved back a week, as we had mentioned, to accommodate for the World Cup. And um, as we mentioned in previous shows as well, this has affected the start list for the Tour de Suisse and the Dauphine, which we had talked about on those two shows. Uh, The Grand Depart starts in, and I'm not going to be able to pronounce this, Normate in Ely. See, I do the French there. Uh, commonly referred to as Normite, and it is a commune located in the northern part of the island of Normite, uh, just off the coast of Vendée Department in the Pays de la Loire region in western France. So, starting up there in western France, we're going to be going clockwise around France this year, and then before ending in, in uh, Paris. Uh, the history of that town, um, with the arrival of a monk, Saint Philibert, in 674, who founded a monastery, the Chateau de Normate. It dates back to the 11th and 12th century. Um, in summer, the area is a tourist resort. It's sister city, Crestview, Florida. So all of those of you out there in Crestview, Florida, your sister city is where the Grand Depart starts this year. Um, so the race doesn't, it doesn't have the usual prologue. Uh, instead, they start right off with stage one. Uh, for the most part, this year's Tour de France, as I said, it gets the clockwise manner starting in the western point, um, moving further west and then north to Brest before heading into Paris, um, towards Paris, I should say, to the east and eventually up to all the way to the north in Robay. After the cobbles in Nor- and, and Robay, which we'll go over, uh, the Tour de France then makes a transfer to the Alps uh, for several successive days before doing the usual move down to the Pyrenees and then up to Paris for the finish. All right, stages that stand out. All right, just going over some of these just little highlights. We have two time trials, two rest days, no prologue, some cobbles, and some really strange short experimental days uh, for the tour. So let's take a closer look at each. <clears throat> time trials. You have a triple T, a team time trial on stage three, 35 kilometers. That's going to start out pretty quick um, in the race, third day in, and you're going to have a little bit of a GC shakeup uh, depending on you know what happens in the first two. So... Uh, I doubt the teams are going to let much get away stages one and two, just so that you can have the stage three come down to uh, the GC guys. Um, individual time trial then, second to last day, at stage 20 for 31 kilometers. So you're really not having much on the TT stuff this year. Uh, the triple T, obviously, but not on the individual. Uh, flat sprinter stages, you know, it's interesting because the first nine stages up to Robay, you can consider a lot of those sprint stages um, but I would say they're more along the lines of like Sagan uh, type of, of days, Sagan, Matthews, uh, Van Avermaet. So you have almost 10 stages that could be sprinters, depending on how they do. That first nine, first week is a lot of lumpy stuff, but not climby, you know, like the, the, with the GC guys. This doesn't include stage nine, though, um, which ends in Robay, which could be a sprinter because it's flat, but likely it's just going to be your... Um, your classics guy. Okay, some unique stages. Uh, cobbles, uh, the race up to Rebay on stage nine, covering 154 kilometers, and I think 11 sections of cobblestone. So it's going to be pretty brutal. Uh, short, we have some short stages. The tour is trying what appears to be new tricks. Uh, they're having some super short climbing mass start stages. Uh, but to the historians of the cycling, there's not necessarily really, they're old, they're, they're kind of old school reprisals of episodes from the 80s. Famously, Andy Hansen won a stage in the 87 Giro that had, I believe, around 60 kilometers in length where he started the day in a skin suit. Uh, like Andy, Stephen Roach did a similar feat in the 87 Tour de France, showed up the start line with a skin suit, very verboten, and um, I think he won that stage as well. It was, it was also a short, short stage. Uh, here in 2018 tour, we have a 108 kilometer climbing exploit on stage 11, and then a super short 65 kilometer explosion on stage 17. They have a grid start, kind of they call it like Formula One. So you see Formula One or let's say it's a NASCAR race where they have qualifying times, and this is going to go off a of GC, and they all uh, just pack in there like that. Have the GC guys up front. I don't know if it's going to be a, a big deal. Um, you know, depending on you may have a guy that's kind of an eighth overall type of guy that's up near the front on GC hasn't cracked yet and perhaps he's going to be able to just take off and see what he can do so it's it's new and it's interesting uh the triple t of course the last in this discussion 
but uh, one of the first events is, is the tr- time team time trial of these interesting stages, as I said, stage three at 35 kilometers. Climbing stages. All right, climbing doesn't really start till stage 10. So you got that first week with a lot of lumpy stuff, narrow roads, uh, cobblestone, team time trial, and then stage 10, Tuesday, July 17, the day after Bastille Day, with a short 108-kilometer stage from Albertville to La Rousseur, Montevallonsen. Um, and when they hit the mountains, they have three consecutive days, including Alpe d'Huez climb. So the climbing stages for that first part are going to be pretty uh, intense. Uh, once they move from the Alps to the Pyrenees, the riders have similar three big days. However, unlike the Alps, they do two stages in the mountain, one day out, and then back on the last one for stage 19, and then the final time trial on stage 20. All right, let's look at the actual stages themselves. <clears throat> Prologue. Stage one, no prologue. So stages one through nine, uh, Saturday to Sunday, ending in Robay. So they're going to have a Sunday finish, um, which, you know, the tour likes to do big races on the weekend for, you know, TV audience and for uh, just an interest in general. Uh, and this one is ending in Robay. So then Bastille Day, I believe. So that first week is a concentration of sprinter stages, some hilly routes, and somewhat technical and hilly TTE, ending with that classic style rendezvous with the uh, Roubaix Velodrome and showers. I'm not sure if it's, I say that, but I'm not sure if it's ending in the Velodrome as in uh, the uh, Paris-Roubaix, but we'll, we'll see at least what they have for us. Week two, after the Monday rest day, the tour starts the first of its three GC climbing days, as I just kind of explained earlier, and the stage 10 from Annecy to Le, uh, Le Grand Bernard at 159 kilometers. The following day is the first of the two wacky short days with rapid 108 fire, four category climb ending on La Rose. Um, and this was, we also previewed this one in the Daphne. So those riders that went and did the Daphne, they got a chance to at least check this out. Um, and of course, they could all do um, their recon as well. Oddly, Alpe d'Huez gets uh, late week billing on Thursday. Um, you'd think it would be a weekend race once again, but maybe it's better for all those fans up there that are known to be getting drunk on the mountain, a little control better uh, rather than the weekend. Uh, but then while Saturday, stage 14, and Sunday, stage 15 aren't shown as big GC climbing days, uh, the ending climb to Mende should be fireworks. Uh, this is the same finish. It's up on a landing strip atop Mende, and it's been used twice prior by, and it's won by Jalabert and then Steve Cummings. They both have wins there. A uh, number two on the Monday, the tour then hits the mountains of the Pyrenees and builds as the week progresses. Uh, yeah, Wednesday stage 17 is the craziest of the stages with that. That's the one, the 65 kilometer with the grid start, similar to like a reverse time trial, starting with giving the better placed riders a spot at the front. Um, I'm sure you'll be able to see those interested in winning or making the time cut, warming up on their trainers or pre-rides and climbing off right from the gun. Uh, there's going to be no neutral. And the first summit up the Col de Paris Sword is just 15K in. That will be crazy day. All right, let's talk about the racers themselves, starting with the sprinters. All right, so the best sprinters in the race as categorized from ProCycling.com is number one, Peter Sagan, Alexander Kristoff, Michael Matthews, Dylan Gronenwagen, Arnold Demar, Sonny Cabrelli, Andre Greipel, Greg Van Averett, Marcel Kittle, Seth Van Mark, Fernando Gaviria at 11th, and 41st first place, Mark Cavendish. So those are the main ones we're going to talk about. And we're also going to talk a little bit about the teams that they have for those uh, support riders. One big note of mention, um, Caleb Ewan is not, was not selected, even though the team had talked about it since December uh, that he was going to be in the tour. He's not. I don't know if it has anything to do with him possibly being linked to going to Lotto Sudal next year. So we'll basically see how that works out. Uh, But it is going to be interesting to see. Uh, that team and their GC hopes and not having Caleb. I was really hoping he was coming in because to me, he's one of the the more exciting sprinters. And, you know, the sprinting this year you've seen is throughout the season, some different names have been popping up. Not one rider has been just really lighting it up, although Gaviria kind of has been. But then you've got basically all these big sprinters have at least a win under their belt coming into the tour. So that should be interesting. Best teams uh, dedicated to the sprinters. Okay, so you got Boro Hansgrohe, they're they're going to be mostly in for Sagan. Uh, they've got Daniel Oss, Burkhart, Postelberger. Those are just some good guys to that. 
An interesting one will be uh, Mark Cavendish. We haven't seen much. He's been injured this year. I think he took a win in Dubai somewhere early in the season. Uh, he's got Mark Renshaw, who his trusty lead out, Slagter, uh, Powells, Edwin Van Bozenhagen. All those guys are really good for the sprint. I didn't see anybody on that team that was really going to be um, battling for GC. They didn't really have a GC rider regardless. Uh, Groupama FDJ, Ar- Arnold DeMar. Um, didn't see much for him for support. Uh, Andre Greipel with Lotto Sadal. He has Degant and uh, Sorry, Degant and Vanenert. Um His team, uh, he'll probably be, he does a great job of jumping onto other teams. Speaking of which, uh, Quick Step Flores with Gaviria. They've got Terpsta, Rikese, Lampert, all good riders uh, for the sprinter. And Gaviria has really been showing himself. Matter of fact, he's been very impressive this year to me since some of these lead up races where he's been getting over climbs and his ability to get over the climbs is a little bit reminiscent of Sagan. So that will be, and Matthews. So it'll be interesting. To, and then he's got one of the best kicks when it comes down to it. Uh, Sunweb with, uh, for Michael Matthews, he's the grinding, defending green Jersey holder. He's got Geshka twins. Um, looks like most of them here for the tour for Tom Dumoulin, so I don't think he's going to have necessarily a great train, but he does a good job, especially those first nine stages with a lot of lumpy stuff going on. He's got a good chance. Uh, Bahrain Merida for Cabrelli. Uh, they've got Heinrich Heisler, Hausler. Um, Cabrelli, he'll probably have to do some surfing to make things do. Trek Sigurdfredo for Degenkall, not much support for him either. Uh, Katusha Albison for Kittle. They have Tony Martin, Rick Zawel, Niels Pollitt. Uh, pretty good, but Kittle hasn't really shown this year that to me that he's in kind of the realm that he's been earlier. So, and they looked at kind of a mess when they came to tour California, trying to set up their sprint train. So not, uh, they have a little bit of work to do. Lotto NL Jumbo for Grona Wagon. Grona Wagon has been one of my guys that I think is going to be lighting it up this year. He won, uh, the last stage of the tour last year and, and, um, on the Champs-Élysées, he's got several wins early this year. And he's, but doesn't look like he's got a lot of support. So we'll kind of see what happens. UAE team Emirates for Kristoff. Uh, most of that team support is going to Dan Martin. Kristoff seems a little plump this year. Uh, seen him at the tour California. Maybe it's the white kit that he has. Um, he just doesn't look like he's quite his, his guy. How many sprint stages possible? Like I said, there's could be 10 uh, for the fast twitch muscle guys for this tour, but there's always a chance that so some of that first week gets nullified and then you're down to just a few GC riders. All right. The best GC riders in the race, according to pro cycling stats.com, um, Chris Froom, number one rider in the world, Mikael Landa. And I don't know why there's, they're skipping around or some of these, but, uh, land is, oh, maybe it's the ones that are in the tour that are, are, um, also the best, um, for the GC Mikael Landa, Egan Bernal, Nairo Quintana, Roman Bardet, Walt Poles, uh, Primoz Roglic, Alejandro Valverde, Richie Port, Yates, Iran, Molima, Thomas, Fuglsang, Soler, Dumoulin, Caruso, Pozzavivo, Kreuzwick, and Nibali. However, this list doesn't give a good summation of all the riders who would be tasked with being the GC team. And so who can we expect for this tour? Let's start right off with Adam Yates. Mitchelton Scott, uh, they look like they've come to this tour with most of their support for him. Well, they have because they've dumped out uh, Caleb Ewing. So they have a, a team, but they didn't, their team doesn't look as strong as it did for um, Simon, his brother in the Giro, where I think they were stacked. Now you had Chavez that kind of shit the bed. And so that didn't work out for him, but um, he should have been able to be supportive. And he was actually there in the first week, Roman Bardet of AG2R, um, what last year third place so he's obviously and he, and he had uh, strada bianca he had a, a good ride there uh richie port for bmc racing i see you know tj's full in for him the team is backing him um he had that bad wreck last year which he it looks like he's recovered he won the tour de suisse so he appears to be back on form rigoberto uran for ef education first drop pack presented by cannondale <clears throat> stupid name uh, haven't seen much of him. He did have that early season contest in Colombia, which went pretty well. I think he was top three or two over there, uh, to Bernal. So with Nairo, so, you know, hopefully he's got his, his team working and you know, that, that team used to be a big team time trial team. Uh, they're not quite set up that way anymore, but they do have, 
uh, Taylor Finney. So Taylor will help him in the time trial, obviously, team time trial, and the uh, the first uh, stage nine into Robay. Uh, Warren Bargui, Team Fontenelle Samsic. Uh, they just got their dropped by their bike sponsor, Look. And then they're with BH team. Uh, I think the Spanish uh, bike team. So they've got some weirdness going on there. But uh, he did not look good early season, just the last few weeks. Um, i trying to remember if he was in the Suisse. I think he was in the Daphne. And he didn't look so good. He's getting dropped early when he shouldn't have been. Um, so he doesn't look quite that thin rail that he was last year's tour. But we'll see how he goes. Nairo Quintana, movie star. They have Nairo, Valverde, and Mikel Landa, a three-prong approach for movie star. And that team also has Soler. So they're looking really good for if that they can make that gel. Uh, Jacob Fuglesong for Astana. He's looked good early on. But, you know, he did last year as well with winning the Daphne. Um, it's Astana. Astana is all in for him. They, they didn't bring a Roo. Uh, well, Aru's not with them anymore, sorry. So they don't really have anybody else, I guess, who they can have. And, and um, Chris Froome, he's been cleared, as I said, to Team Sky. Uh, they've also got Garrett Thomas and Egon Bernal. Um, decent team, as always, and you expect. Uh, it'll be it, uh, Chris coming off of the Giro. It'll be kind of interesting to see if he's got the pop that he needs for the Tour, and maybe that brings him back a little bit to the other riders, and which should be fun. Uh, speaking of which, you've got Tom Dumoulin, who went toe to toe with him in the, the him being Chris Room in the Giro for Team Sunweb. They look to have a decent team. I saw American Chad Haga made the uh, roster, so that would be good for him. Uh, Vincenzo and his first Tour de France, uh, Vincenzo Nibali, Barra and Merida. You know he's won all three Grand Tours. He did great in I want to say 2014, the year he won with Astana on the cobblestones that day. Um, I think he was second to his own teammate. So he's, um, you know, you never know about Nibali. He hasn't looked super good, but I think he, he plays a different game. Uh, Baca Malama, Trek Sigafredo, that's their one big shot. I don't know what we're going to get out of him. Uh, you never know. Ilnar, Zakarin, and, and, you know, these guys are maybe second tier. Ilnar, Zakarin, for Katusha Elpison. They've also got Ian Boswell who's doing his first tour. Uh, then you got Steven Kreuzwick for uh, Team Lotto Jumbo. They, but they've also got Primus Rojlik doing the tour. I think he won a stage last year as well. It'll be interesting to see how he goes after his phenomenal season so far, winning these little seven-day stage, I shouldn't say little, but they're seven-day stage races and, and doing it in, in pretty good uh, in pretty good fashion. Dan Martin, a UAD, um, he, you know, they have a Rue that didn't come here who also had a horrible Giro. Uh, Dan Martin's kind of liege. He kind of looked like he was stepping back up. He also did well in the pre-tour racing. Did he do the Daphne or the Swiss? I, I, know, I think it was Swiss. And he looked like kind of himself. So um, should be interesting to see how he does on this one. I'm going to also mention uh, Guillaume uh, Martin of the Wanty Gobert group. I'm not sure exactly what that team is. Uh, but he's a continental rider, very little guy, climbs well, um, I think he'll get his chance. Maybe he's progressing up enough. Uh, so you look at the best teams dedicated to the GC riders. I think you start with number one being Team Sky, then G- BMC, and possibly AG2R. Uh, although anything after Sky and BMC, it just kind of, well, Mitchell's and Scott should be as well. How many GC stages are available? Well, we've got about eight or nine, uh, dependent with for the climbing, team time trial, and the time trial, all of which give a GC rider a good shot to take control um, or to lose their chances, which you're going to see possibly in the first nine days uh, that can happen. It was interesting. Movie star had mentioned about why they're bringing three riders and they're like, Hey, um, you know, coming out of that first week, it gives us three chances to come out clean. In other words, I mean, they may have a rider that goes down and they're like, okay, well, we've got these other two. Uh, that's always a chance, you know, it'd be kind of nice. The TT coming up early may give one of these teams you know, if they get a, a bust out move or, you know, kind of a better uh, number on over some of the other ones or some of these riders totally lose it. Um, sometimes that eases that front pressure to be on the front as much as you always do with when these guys, you know, 10 guys still within um, shooting distance of the lead. Uh, the priority Robay stage is also an additional day for losing the GC. Um, I don't think it's one that will be taking control 
but it's definitely one that they can they can obviously use at. Um, also, like but like I said, we saw Nibbly in 2014 with his impressive ride, and kind of t- solidifying it. And I think that was the same day Chris Froome crashed. I think it was before the cobbles though, uh, and exited the tour that day. Things that make you go hmm. Well, like I said, over the weekend we had it was announced that Ray ASO would be attempting to block Chris Froome from participating in the 2018 edition of the race. Uh, the reasoning was that the Samal Salbutamol issue uh, was not resolved and they didn't want him to race and they gave the legal reason of, you know, it doesn't shed a good light. I think it's like Rule 28 of the UCI code. Uh, does it shed a good light on the sport or it's unbecoming to the sport's image? Um, this was never going to work. It, they tried it with Tom Boonin before where he was cleared and, and you know, to race legally... Froome was allowed to race legally now, and now since has been um, that was Tom Boonin's things which were out of out of competition, positive test for cocaine. Um, so ASO's request would likely go before the French Sporting Commission to make the decision. Um, however, with now that the request is no longer valid and they've been withdrawn, uh, with the announcement that Froome's Vuelta Spagna test issue has been resolved and he's been cleared to race, and so no analytical adverse finding was. Um, a judgment was found therefore he's good to go and with that we're going to see Fruman tour ASO is not going to be able to make a stink about it I don't know how if that's good or bad uh, either way all right so that's the 2018 Tour de France preview show I uh, hope you enjoyed it uh, we're going to do uh, try to get some more breakdown of the tour uh, as it's happening uh, perhaps some live YouTube feeds. We we'll maybe get some chatting in there as soon as the stage breaks. Uh, it, I might have to do that depending on my work schedule, but we'll try to do some of those as the tour finishes in the morning. Um, and so look for our, all our links, mostly our, our Facebook page. We can find all that stuff. We'll try to post notices in there. Once again, thanks for tuning into the Between Two Wheels podcast. Um, it's been fun and enjoy the tour. <laughs>